In this video, we're going to review the guidelines from EMA and FDA that refer to immunogenicity safety assessments. Both guidelines are listing to follow reactions to the administration of the drug, hyperacute and acute reactions or anaphylaxis, cytokine release syndrome, delayed or non-acute reactions, and if your drug has an endogenous counterpart, how would an immunogenic response to the drug cross-react to that endogenous counterpart and follow the safety. So let's take a look at the Gell and Coombs classification to understand how do we follow these or how do we put them in context of the clinic. The first one corresponds to types 1 to 4 hypersensitivity reactions. The second is type 1 hypersensitivity. Cytokine release syndrome is a response of innate and adaptive immune responses. The delayed or non-acute reactions are type 3 and type 4 hypersensitivity reactions. And finally, a cross-reactivity to an endogenous counterpart would be a type 2 hypersensitivity when your endogenous counterpart is a surface target. So let's review this so that you know how to follow them in the clinic. According to the Gell and Coombs classification, type 1 hypersensitivity is an immediate reaction mediated by granulocyte activation. Type 2 is antibody mediated and there are several different effector cells. Type 3 requires the formation of immune complexes and type 4 is T cell mediated. Type 1 is basically dependent on IgE and it's responsible for atopy, allergy and anaphylactic responses. Type 2 antibody mediated is basically mediated by IgG, but it also requires tissue specific antigens that this IgG will identify. And there's three subtypes of type 2, antibody dependent cell cytotoxicity, also known as ADCC, complement dependent cytotoxicity, also known as CDC, and antibody dependent phagocytosis. Type 3 immune complex mediated response can produce organ deposition of the immune complexes that could be either IgG or IgM, and this can cause a tissue or organ damage. Type 4 T cell mediated could be Th1 or Th17 CD4 positive response, which is also known as delayed type hypersensitivity or it could be mediated by activation of cytotoxic T cells directly, which are CD8 positive. Anaphylactic responses to a drug is when the drug is recognized by an antigen presenting cell, such as the B cell, for example. This presents to the T cell the epitope that comes from the drug, differentiates the T cell into a Th2 that produces interleukin-4, which activates B cells and eventually maturates and differentiates them into plasma cells and memory B cells. These plasma cells are responsible for the production of IgE that now recognizes the drug. So the importance of this IgE comes because there are some cells that are specifically having a receptor to the IgE, but they will get engaged only when the IgE is recognizing the putative danger signal, which in our case would be a drug. This activation of the granulocytes makes them migrate to wherever the drug is. So evidently, if it's intravenous, it will be everywhere. If it's sub-Q or intramuscular, these granulocytes may actually migrate to the site of the drug and degranulate. This degranulation causes an effect on smooth muscle, blood vessels. This can cause severe low blood pressure, even shock mucous gland responses, and also activation of eosinophils because they also have a receptor for IgE. It's a lower affinity receptor, but if, if the IgE that binds the drug is present, it will also engage the eosinophils that in turn will also degranulate their proteases. All of this happens very quickly. It's a very fast response. That's why it's called acute or immediate response. 
And it's the reason why we need to keep patients in observation when we first inject drugs before we know the characterization of the drug and the risk of producing a potential anaphylactic response. These responses could be mild, like localized erythema, swelling, pruritus, maybe feeling a bit sick or headache, but they could be mild or they could even be lethal. So because there's all grades of responses and they're very idiosyncratic, we need to make sure that we characterize them. Now, they are dependent on the presence of antibodies. So which kind of antibody to which part of the drug, in this case, we would be assessing? Well, it would depend on the therapeutic protein that we're using. It could be a complex protein, could be gene therapy, could be a nanoparticle. So any drug antibodies, they could be directed to the whole drug. They could be to the delivery strategy, for instance, a piece of the antibody drug conjugate in the linker. Uh, it could be to the oligonucleotide if we're talking about gene therapy, or it could be to the gene product. So if we have a response like this, we need to characterize it. Uh, but the characterization in terms of any drug antibodies would be done retrospectively. The first thing is identify the clinical signs and symptoms and treat immediately. As I mentioned, this reaction could be as quick as minutes and it could be lethal. So there's no need to wait for antibodies uh, to the drug to confirm the diagnosis. Anaphylaxis is a clinical diagnosis. FDA recommends we use a Samson criteria, which tells us anaphylaxis is highly likely when any one of the following three criteria are fulfilled. Now, these criteria were not written for immunogenic responses. FDA recommends we apply the criteria to identify potential anaphylaxis as an immunogenic response. So what are the three criteria? First one tells us there should be an acute onset. The second one is when you know that the individual is exposed to a likely allergen. How do you put this in context of immunogenic responses? Well, if the profile of your drug has already been identified as having a risk for immunogenic response, it's uh, either having a potential for producing anti-drug antibodies and you've characterized that it's a likely allergen. Likewise, when it says known allergen, it would be when you do know that your drug will produce any drug antibodies in the majority of the patients. So with you, this setting, you know which of the three criteria to apply. And bottom line is that basically they have skin and mucosal manifestations, respiratory compromise, reduced blood pressure, and there can also be gastrointestinal symptoms. Now, the important thing is this is a clinical diagnosis. It has to be done fast. So how do we put it in context with a little table of interpretation of guidelines when they say what would be recommended? The recommendation for the analysis of potential anti-drug antibodies, this is mediated by IgE, would be to the whole drug to the delivery strategy if we're talking about, for instance, a nanoparticle or, or an antibody drug conjugate or a vector, the, to the oligonucleotide in gene therapy or nanoparticles or to the gene product. This would be done retrospectively. We should not wait for this. If, if you can see, the Samsung criteria has absolutely no requirement for testing any kind of immunoglobulin or antibodies in the blood. It's a clinical diagnosis, but for the analysis of the drug and for characterization of immunogenicity, this would be an important piece of information that you need to include. There's a Brighton criteria for anaphylaxis. Now, these uh, have been issued for immunization, so they're commonly used for characterization of potential anaphylaxis after vaccination. However, the EMA may request it if you're not working on a vaccine uh, that you use the Brighton criteria for anaphylaxis. So you have the option of using Samson for FDA and Brighton if these were re recommended. They have a lot of similarities. First of all, in the Brighton criteria, you will read that it's a very quick response. It's a fast response. And then Brighton has major and minor criteria. This could be programmatically uh, designed for uh, for an algorithm, but generally they have 
again, skin or mucosa, cardiovascular compromise, which is basically reduced blood pressure, respiratory compromise, and in a minor criteria, you have gastrointestinal. The minor criteria for laboratory abnormalities is not referring to antibodies. Although this is an IgE mediated, again, when we look at the table, the recommendation of looking at anti-drug antibodies in the case of anaphylaxis would be to the whole drug, the liver strategy, to the oligonucleotide or gene product, depending if we're using gene therapy or nanoparticles with uh, the liver strategy or antibody drug conjugates. This would be the retrospective. This doesn't need to be done for the diagnosis. If you see the diagnosis is clinical and it may be supported by either the Samson or the Brighton criteria. Type 2 hypersensitivity requires tissue-specific antigens and there is complement activation by IgG. So this is when you have an IgG that is specific to the drug. And when you have a surface antigen that is recognized by your drug. So your drug has been designed, engineered to bind a surface antigen. You happen to have an IgG, an anti-drug antibody that will bind the drug that is bound to the particular cell. This could activate the complement system, create the membrane attack complex, and this kills the cell that bears that particular receptor where the drug is bound. So you would know in your particular programs, what is the mechanism of action of your drug? Is it binding a cell surface? Which kind of cells have it? So that you can follow if you need to follow, for instance, the erythrocyte counts or white blood cell counts. You need to follow the liver functions, depending on where your drug is bound. If you're suspecting a type two hypersensitivity response with complement activation, you need to know which kind of safety assessments you have to build in your clinical program so that you can make a very informed guideline to the practicing physician if the drug is approved. Now, this particular um, type 2 hypersensitivity is the first subset. It's called CDC or complement dependent cytotoxicity because what kills the cell is a membrane attack complex from the complement activation. And there are several examples in the clinic where this is the mediation for that disease. If we go back to our table, this will have uh, an anti-drug antibody because you would need to have that IgG, but you would also have complement activation. So what would be important to do is any drug antibody to the whole drug product, to the delivery strategy. So if you have a vector or if you have a lipid nanoparticle, to the oligonucleotide would not be necessarily needed because if the oligonucleotide would not be too long outside the cell. So remember these oligonucleotides are for internal delivery. So they would be destroyed in the extracellular space. But the gene product, which is a protein, and then you would have to look at complement activation and buy all of those. These are things you don't need to have for the diagnosis. Again, the diagnosis would be clinical based on the organ that you're looking at. If it's the liver, you follow liver function tests. Uh, if it's the kidney, you follow the kidney function tests. But retrospectively, you would have to have the samples so that you can test if these were associated to the start of the adverse event. The second subset of type 2 hypersensitivity will be phagocytosis mediated by IgG. The patient creates IgG antibodies to the drug. And this drug is going to bind surface antigens. Again, you know which organs and which tissue is expressing the receptor that your drug is going to bind. And if the patient develops antibodies to that drug, they could activate complement three. And this activation of C3 will engage macrophages that directly produce phagocytosis of that cell. So once again, you should know which organs and which tissue expresses the receptor of your drug. And if the patient 
develops anti-drug antibodies, they could be having phagocytosis of those organs and cells. The diagnosis is clinical. You would have to know if you need to follow liver function tests or renal or erythrocytes, neutrophils, whatever you need to follow depending on your drug and depending on the patient producing antibodies. Again, the particular table on the top right would apply, same as before, that retrospectively you would need to assess any drug antibodies and complement activation, not only to the whole drug, but to the different components. By the way, this is the mediation of the RH incompatibility between mother and child. The third subtype of type 2 hypersensitivity is antibody dependent cell cytotoxicity, and it depends on having an IgG that identifies a drug. Now, in this case, also is a surface antigen, and your drug is bound to the cell membrane when the IgG engages with the drug that is bound to the cell, it can activate a series of effector cells. What they have in common is that they have a receptor for the FC portion of the IgG. And by having this receptor of the IgG FC portion, all of these effector cells will produce a degranulation a secretion of granzymes that eventually destroy the tissue. Once more, you do need to know which is the tissue that is expressing the receptor where your drug is binding, and you would need to follow if this were the case of an immunogenic response that it's a type 2 ADCC. This can be tested preclinically. You can know and detect if your drug has the ability to engage this FC receptor and produce degranulation. Several examples in the clinic are secondary to this particular disease or this particular mechanism. If you go top to the table, in this case, you don't need to follow complement activation because there's no complement activation when you have ADCC. And again, this will come in the investigator's brochure and you would know if the particular drug that you are developing has any risk of ADCC before you even go to the clinic. Type 3 hypersensitivity is mediated by immune complex formation. They could be IgM or IgG. What happens is if you have a drug that tends to form aggregates or be very close to particular cells or organs, and there's an anti-drug antibody that happens to be aggregated very close together, this can activate the complement and C5A and C3B could engage and activate neutrophils that will release antimicrobial peptides and produce inflammation. But most importantly, they also release three C3A, C4A and C5A, which are very strong activators of mast cells. These mast cells will degranulate. And look, the granules have very potent enzymes that will destroy the tissue that's nearby. So in this case, you would also need to have information preclinically if there's the likelihood of aggregation if you think that there's going to be a likelihood because of the mechanism of action or because of the structure of the protein that you're using for the drug, it could be a complex biologic. If you think there's a potential that they would be aggregating together, you could have immune complex deposition. And this is something that you can detect also in the tox, tox studies preclinically. There's a lot of different conditions that are related to this immune complex mediated disease, and all of them have in common that they are not quick to react. They can happen within two weeks after the injection, for instance, on serum sickness. They don't happen immediately. The Arthur's reaction can happen three days after the injection. So all of these take time. 
So they are delayed, they are not immediate, but they depend on having antibodies. The diagnosis is again clinical, but when you're doing the analysis of your drug, you need to know if there were antibodies to the whole drug, the delivery strategy, not to the oligonucleotides because again extracellularly the nucleic acids are very quickly destroyed and to the gene product and likewise there's complement activation so you would also have to have banked samples for complement activation detection that would be coincident with the manifestations Medical evaluation should be performed for every adverse event reported. The signs and symptoms of an immune complex mediated type 3 hypersensitivity response that is related to the drug are varied. So that's the reason why everything has to be considered, including a delay in the symptoms from the time of administration, because it does take time to form the immune complexes and also to deposit in organs to cause these signs and symptoms. Complement levels should lower. And the important thing also for immune complex mediated immunogenically related adverse events is that they would resolve when the antibodies, which means anti drug antibodies, in circulation outnumber the antigens, which is the drug. So, whenever these symptoms are occurring, you have to follow if they are resolving and also look at the ADA titers at that time and the PK of the drug. And when we say the anti drug antibody titers, you need to consider if your program is a complex biologic and if you have several anti drug antibody assays because you have several components of the drug that you're looking for potential immunogenic responses. So, all of these would need to be assessed retrospectively once the trial is over. The other thing you need to consider when assessing these adverse events is that there's memory. So first time it would be delayed, second time is shorter. It's never really as short as five minutes, except when this immune complex mediated response, which is originally IgG or IgM, could be producing a memory B cell that matures and eventually produces an isotype switch causing a type 1 anaphylactic reaction. So this is the same reaction to the same component of the drug. And when you look at any drug antibodies, they should be associated with both the type 3 and the type 1 events. Type 4 hypersensitivity is mediated by a cellular response. What happens is the drug is actually on a target cell. And if uh, this particular drug produces epitopes that are identified by a dendritic cell, it travels through the lymph nodes and it will present pieces of your drug to the T cell. And with the appropriate co-stimulatory signals, this T cell will differentiate into a Th1 that will activate macrophages, or it can also differentiate into a Th17 that will recruit neutrophils. And this is all in response to your drug. So the macrophages and neutrophils will go and find the tissues or the organs where your drug is and they will produce destruction or damage to your organ or tissue. This is an immunogenicity response that is independent of anti-drug antibodies. It's entirely driven by cell responses. The Th1 and Th17 CD4 positive responses are also called delayed type hypersensitivity. There's a delay in the production of the damage. Now, remember that type 3 immune complex disease also has a lag time of about two weeks. So there are two different types of delay hypersensitivity. One is mediated by immune complexes and dependent on IgG and IgM. And this one that we're talking about is independent of anti-drug antibodies. It's entirely cellular response. There are several examples of DTH that are very well characterized. Now, the thing is, what causes the damage is cytokine release by all of these adaptive and innate cells that have been activated. So cytokines are a lot of them 
and it will depend on your drug and the profile that you have seen, which are the cytokines that are more likely to be responding in a particular setting for a particular drug. Another way of producing a cell-mediated immune response is when the dendritic cell identifies the drug as potential danger signal. And in this case, this epitope will be slightly different and the costimulatory signals are different too. So when they travel to the lymph nodes, instead of activating the uh, CD4 T cells, they will activate the CD8 positive T cells. They, these cells then go back and drain through the subclavian vein to the systemic blood circulation and these T cells now identify the target cell that has the drug and they will directly produce cytotoxic responses. So this is another way of having a cell mediated response. It's mediated by CD8 positive cytotoxic T cells and it will destroy the organs that you have. So it is important to know that your drug it will, if it causes a potential cytotoxic response or cell-mediated immune response. You need to know which are the organs or the tissue that would be mostly impacted. Now, if we go back now to the table of the potential assays that would be recommended, now we don't have antibodies in here, but we have potentially T cell assays, innate cytokines, and T cell cytokine release. So to what? Well, in this case, it would be to all of these components. All of them could potentially cause a cell mediated response. So if this has been a risk identified preclinically, or if you suspect in the clinic this could happen, and it could be part of the mechanism of action in some oncology programs, you may actually be doing uh, an increase of susceptibility so that this is a mechanism of action, but you don't want this to cause a serious adverse event. You want it to destroy the target cell if the target cell is cancer. But if there's any kind of cross reactivity to a normal cell and you may be seeing this, then it would be immunogenic. So again, there's no recipe for it. You do need to assess related to the program that you're working with. The definition of cytokine release syndrome is provided as a superphysiologic response that will stimulate T cells and other immune effector cells. The signs and symptoms are many, but it's been identified that fever has to occur in all of them. And the onset may be delayed, but never beyond 14 days. The important thing about the grading is that it provides us an idea of what kind of measurements we need to collect to be doing the grading for cytokine release syndrome. As if you realize in here, the grading does not have to do with any kind of laboratory testing, but it's basically clinical. Medical evaluation of all the adverse events should be done as the trial is ongoing to identify potential signs and symptoms of cytokine release syndrome. You also have to plan for banking samples for the different tests, of course, cytokines. Now, these are examples of cytokines and this would be driven by your program. If you know already, let's say based on mechanism of action, that there are some cytokines that will be induced, you want them at a certain level, but of course you don't want them to be grade three or higher. You don't want them to be an adverse event. So you might need to have some tests ready for quantitating the amount of cytokine that you're getting and understanding which would be the abnormal, the unwanted immunogenic adverse event. On the other hand, some of the drugs could potentially cause an increase in cytokines, although it's not the mechanism of action, but they could trigger a superphysiologic response of these cells that belong to the innate and the adaptive immune system. So the list is tailored to your program, but also you need to consider complement levels.
In terms of the clinical management, you need to make sure that all clinical trials, including first in human, are going to evaluate them and consider when is the first time of appearance of these symptoms after drug administration. You also need to identify what would be the next, the tests that you need to do in the bank sam sample syrups. Um, this is important because you do need to plan for how to collect, how to handle, how to ship these samples and when to do it. And when you are going to analyze retrospectively a potential cytokine release syndrome, you need to know when were those samples taken and are they suitable for the test. You may have false negative tests if you didn't collect the samples correctly and now you are measuring a particular cytokine and the test is not appropriate for the way the sample was handled. You need to manage individual case by cases. This is what the ASTCT consensus guidelines is telling us. There's a myriad of different options depending on the grading, but they all, they all have to follow local practice. And you need to include these cases in the narrative of the reporting and also on the dossier. Time for a knowledge check. So question number five, delayed immune responses are always type four hypersensitivity and do not involve anti-drug antibodies. Well, the delayed type hypersensitivity is a type four hypersensitivity, but a delayed immune response can also be a type three, which is dependent on IgG or IgM, and it's due to immune complex deposition. So that's why this response is false. T-cell cytokines and complement levels identify a cytokine release syndrome due to the drug. No, uh, it is. It has to be clinical. So you identify cytokine release syndrome using the grading. You can identify it merely on clinical signs and symptoms. You need to review every adverse event. And retrospectively, you can do the assays for cytokines complement levels, innate cytokines related to that adverse event, but the diagnosis is clinical. Finally, let me just briefly talk about the guideline on immunogenicity that relates to the labeling. So in the labeling, there's going to be a section for FDA that summarizes immunogenicity. It is currently a draft guidance, and it's basically just focusing on anti-drug antibodies. But I wouldn't doubt it if a final guidance includes beyond anti-drug antibodies, includes T cells or complement levels or other kind of measurements. Currently, it's basically anti-drug antibodies related to the adverse events and only focus on clinically significant effects. In this particular guidance, you can read it completely, but it basically just says immunogenicity and then any drug antibody associated adverse reactions. Again, only clinically significant because they're focusing on the prescriber. Prescribers, well, they should read the label so that they understand what they are prescribing and they should just focus on what's clinically relevant. If you are going to have injection related reactions that are just mild redness that disappears within an hour, those are not clinically significant. They should not worry about that. But if you have a potential grade three reaction with low blood pressure or respiratory compromise, then it does have to go in the label. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you found it uh, informative and I hope that you learned something from watching it. Please remember that I have other videos in my channel, also educational videos, and consider subscribing to my channel. Thank you very much and have a good day.